Дорогие коллеги, как и в прошлом году, нашу научную, научную часть нашей конференции открывает профессор генетик Чарльз Васки. Одевайте, пожалуйста, наушники. Чарльз Васки, вице-президент компании геномных исследований Nantomics. И все, что произошло буквально вот еще недавно в этом году вы сегодня услышите thank you um, I wish to thank Tatiana for inviting me here to speak today I apologize that my topic will be quite a bit different than most of the rest of them I'm a, I'm a researcher I primarily focus on um, translational research bringing um, research from cancer uh, the cancer field to the clinic so this is a little bit of a departure from most of the rest of your topics Um, but I think it has great interest to those who are interested in the brain. I'm going to be speaking about a technology um, called single-cell mRNA sequencing. Um, this is a new technology that allows us to look at individual cells and see what each individual cell is expressing in terms of proteins. Um, this is a huge advancement for neurology because in the past we've only been able to look at batches of cells at once. And due to the great diversity of neurons um, and glial cells, this has made it quite difficult to study the brain with expression technologies. Um, also, since those gene expression changes drive the differences in neurons, it's essential to understanding neuronal function and how different neurons function. In order to get there, I will first talk a little bit about the, the process of single-cell mRNA sequencing, um, and then also how RNA data is processed. After that, I will move into a little bit of an example on skin um, single-cell RNA sequencing. Um, this is something that I've worked on personally. And then finally, I will present a little bit of other people's work on brain single-cell sequencing. Um, so, as an example, I'm going to use a system called 10x, um, and this is, there are many uh, available systems for this, but this is one that, that is most easy to, uh, to obtain at the moment. Um, the process of molecular biology relies upon many different enzymatic processes in containers, so in vials and in flasks. Um, the advancement for single cell technologies is that now uh, we can create our little flasks for individual cells. And the technology for this is called an emulsion. So by flowing individual cells at the right pressure into um, an oil mixture, we can create individual wells of, of water and a cell and enzymes with an oil container around it. What this allows then is to do processing on individual cells and to keep all of the, the contents of an individual cell um, in one unit. And one key part of that are these gel beads, a barcoded gel bead. And so a barcode refers to a sequence of A, C's, G's, and T's that are unique for that particular bead and allows us to later identify the source of different um, of different reactions. So after performing that process of creating this emulsion of individual cells with beads, um, we have uh, a cell and a bead, and now we can perform reactions by changing the temperature of the emulsion. Um, in particular, we will lyse the cells, uh, to break open the cells, um, then we will label each of the mRNA molecules um, with the particular barcode of that gel bead. Now what Though there are only four colors here, um, in reality, there are billions of different barcodes available. So that allows us to have a unique tag um, for all of the mRNA molecules from an individual cell. Um, so the reaction that comes out of this afterwards is now we have uh, individual barcodes attached to each individual messenger RNA in a cell. Um, and so what we get after some computational processing Um, is we have the R R RNA sequence, which you will uniquely identify a gene, and then we also have the barcode sequence, which uniquely identifies which cell that molecule came from. 
Um, so by doing this mapping process of reading this, the DNA sequence from the barcode and also the RNA sequence, for each individual molecule, we can associate which gene and which cell it came from. And so for perhaps 10,000 cells um, and 20,000 genes, we can create a large matrix of expression counts. And so we can just go ahead and count every single entry in the table. Um, and now this provides a description of each of these cells. Now, uh, the key part here is that um, each gene defines what that cell is doing. So when there's more of a gene activity on, there's more of the protein, and that changes how that particular cell functions. Um, so uh, there's a couple steps after we get this large matrix of data before we can do some, uh, some science with it. Uh, one, one problem with this technology is that uh, there are dropouts. So, uh, the difficulty of the actual molecular biology is that only about one in 10 molecules will get a barcode and become sequenced. Um, so that gives us a table with lots of zeros in it, and overall, very low counts. Now, the, the range of expression from one gene to, the other, to another gene can be anywhere from 10,000 to 100,000 100, times as strong. So the concentration range is extremely large, but our counts are very low here. Um, so we have to use lots of statistical methods to correct for these dropouts. Um, I will skip over most of that, but if you're interested in math, that is my specialty and I would love to discuss it more. Um, so once we have this table of, of all the expression counts, we can now convert this into cell-to-cell -cell comparison. So we can look at each cell's um, gene expression numbers, compare it to the next cell, and see how similar those two are. So, for example, um, if we compare cell one to cell two, perhaps they have very close um, expression, they have almost identical numbers, then we will give us a, a high similarity. Um, once we get this large similarity matrix where we compare each cell to each other cell, we can start to cluster the cells into groups. Um, once we have similar groups, we can learn more about that group together. Um, and since we have this problem of having very few molecules per cell, um, by having this clustering of, of groups of cells, we can learn more about each individual cell as well. And so this is a very difficult problem to visualize since we have 20,000 different genes. That's um, a 20,000 dimensional space. Um, but there are some algorithms that help us look at this um, a bit more visually. Um, so here I'm showing you 25,000 cells uh, from skin from a chest. Um, from three different samples. Now, each individual point here is rep represents one individual cell. And when we have two points that are close together, that means that they're very, uh, very similar in their gene expression matrix. When they're further apart, they are less similar. And what becomes quite apparent immediately is that there are groups of different isolated uh, islands of cells and also large bodies of cells that are very similar to each other. Um, this particular Algorithm is called TISNI, um, and what it, it just lets us visualize this whole group of cell at once. Now, um, this is from chest. If we look at, um, at scalp samples, we see a somewhat similar picture. So all of these cells are colored by, um, by clustering. Um, I've taken the yellow from here. It means that they're also similar to these cells over here. Uh, and we have a very similar picture, but with different populations of cells. Um, this orange group, for example, is much larger than over here in chest. Now, once we have these groups of cells, we might want to figure out what are they, how do we figure out what they are actually doing, and how are they related to each other in skin. Uh, so, for example, let's look at these red cells here. Um, so, they're both colored red because they're very similar in between the two different samples. By looking at what genes are up, we can now try to identify what, uh, what these cells are doing. And so for each gene, we can perform a test that says, how different is this gene in this cluster here compared to all the rest of the clusters? And this will let us rank the genes into those that are more specific and up in this cluster and down in the rest of the, of the cells. So this will give us gene markers for that particular cluster. And so in this plot here, I'm showing about 500 genes. Um, each point here represents one gene. 
and its position on the y-axis is how strong of a marker it is for that particular cluster. So for example, the, the two highest genes are CD74 and HLA-DRA, and these are two genes that are only expressed in immune cells. So these two genes uniquely identify um, this cluster as an immune cluster. So this small cluster of cells are the, the cells in the skin that belong to the immune system. And from that, we can, we can see that there's a small percentage of the overall amount, which is what we might expect from, uh, from immune cells. We can do this also for all the rest of the clusters here to provide um, a, a high-level summary of what each, each cluster does. Uh, so for example, um, all of these cells here express keratin, and keratin is a key skin component. Um, the green uh, cells here are in the basal layer of, of the skin, so this is the bottom layer of the skin. Um, we find markers for the spinous layer, which is one layer above the, uh, the basal layer. We also find this large group of mitotic, what we call mitotic cells. And these are cells that are dividing and, and growing much more than the rest. Um, finally, we see a small amount of cells from the granular layer, and the granular layer is the outer layer of the skin, but it's also the layer of the skin which is dying and therefore doesn't produce much mRNA. Uh, finally, we have some melanocytes um, and the immune cells, as I mentioned before. There's also some interesting cells uh, the, here, the, the Wnt I, uh, which were a, a sort of a new group of cells that had not been shown before to have this particular set of genes. Also, these ion channel genes, which were not known to be, exist in the skin before, but also this yellow hair follicle region, which, which was known to exist before. Um, so we can focus in a little bit more on this particular follicle and also these unknown groups to try to figure out what they are doing. Um, so doing another clustering of all, just those hair follicle cells, we come up with a new uh, clustering of, of groups and we were able to map some of these genes to individual parts of the hair follicle here. Uh, for example, we, with some investigation, we found um, that this Wnt I group also had KRT6A high, and in mouse, uh, it was known that this is part of the particular bulge of the hair follicle. Um, also, all the other groups map to either the, the sweat gland, the sebaceous gland, or to other parts of the, um, of the interfollicular epidermis. Um, so this is sort of an example of how we can look at individual data sets on a very simple organ and, and see how, how the cells uh, map to different parts of the anatomy. One other fascinating thing that we can do with this technology is map differentiation from one state to another. Because since we have cells that are along the entire spectrum from basal to spinous to granular, we can see the path in, um, in this two-dimensional plot of space of how those cells develop. Now, this particular visualization is a rotation of that 20,000-dimensional space to the directions of most variation. And if we rotate it slightly differently, we can see very clear, channel, uh, clear paths for that differentiation path to, to channel, to the hair follicle, and to the Wnt I group. Um, so the, the single cell data set provides us not only what genes are on or off, but also how the cells differentiate and the, the differentiation paths to get from one cell type to another by tracing the expression path. Um, so, Perhaps the most interest will be the brain for this audience. And there was a fascinating paper published uh, just two months ago uh, using brain samples and this technology. Um, so it's, the text is a little bit garbled here, I apologize for that. Um, but they took samples from the frontal cortex, from the visual cortex, and also from the cerebellar, uh, cerebellar hemisphere. Now, the difficulty with brain compared to other tissues is that uh, neurons are quite entangled with each other and it's hard to dissociate individual cells from each other. So rather than doing single cell sequencing, they extracted the nuclei, which are easier to handle, and pr pr perform the same technique afterwards. Now, after doing mRNA sequencing, they also did another uh, technology called chromatin DNA accessibility sequencing. And though I won't talk about that right now, this is a technology that lets you know how genes turn on or off and what the mechanism for gene regulation might be. Um, 
So let's see what, lo what a brain looks like in single cell sequencing. Um, so uh, what we have here is up on top, uh, we have a whole bunch of oligodendrocytes. We have glial cells um, and we have astrocytes over here. We also have many clusters for neurons, for um, inhibitory neurons and ex excitory neurons here. And I apologize again for the text, it might lost, a little bit was lost in the translation. Um, these are Purkinje neurons and granular cells. Um, but the most interesting thing is that excitory neurons and inhibitory neurons are not one large group. They have many small subgroups, many small subclusters, and we can now go and investigate and see what differentiates different neurons from each other. And we do not yet know this biology, but this, this provides a map for further investigation for what is going on in the brain. Um, now, there are some differences between different brain parts. Um, so there's the visual cortex that was sampled, the cerebellum, and also the frontal cortex here. Now, there, uh, if you look at the, the same map that we showed before, these are now colored by this section. So the cerebellum has very distinct clustering from all of the rest of the, of the brain sections. The cerebellum has extremely different expression, even for similar cell types. However, the visual cortex and the frontal cortex mostly overlap on what they express. Um, so this might be expected based on what we already know of the brain, but we can find some more detail that we did not expect. Um, so this is a different plot of that same clustering now. So uh, excuse the confusion here, but so these are all the ex excitory uh, clusters. These are the inhibitory clusters. These are the Purkinje neurons and astrocytomas, or excuse me, um, <laughs> uh, astrocytes. And then on this region over here, it's showing what is, where the source of those cells came from. So these blue sections came almost entirely from the visual cortex. Um, these uh, other clusters have a mixture of all parts of the cortex. And then these, section, these clusters here are purely from the cerebellum. Um, so by looking at these individual clusters, we can also go back and see what genes are up or off in them. And that's, those are these genes over here. So the, here we have some transporter genes that transport, um, uh, I believe this is uh, glutamate. And we also have a DNA binding gene, which turns other genes on or off. Um, and so we, now we have a, a very detailed map of what's going on for different types of neurons in, in the brain, in a normal brain. Um, one other thing we can do is the same trajectory. And here I'm showing one example of how um, how myelation happens in oligodendrocytes. Um, so what they took one path, just this cluster there and that cluster there, and they're showing only those two clusters of cells and the path of differentiation along here from an oligodendrocyte precursor to a mature oligodendrocyte. And here in this plot, um, each, each cell here is one point. Um, over here, each cell is one column. And then this is the gene, uh, the expression of each gene along the row. So these here are the, the oligodendrocyte precursors. These are the immature oligodendrocytes. And these are the mature oligodendrocytes. Um, so we now know what genes are on in each different part of this, and we can um, identify normal function of a brain uh, myelination. And in diseased brain, we have the potential to, to figure out what is going on to prevent normal myelination in the future. Um, so in summary, th this is a new technology that, is, uh, uh, that poses great promise for investigation in the brain and in all human tissues. Um, and it allows us to discover what heterogeneity is in tissues before we could never discover individual cells' behavior in the same way on a global scale. Um, and now we can also discover how cells differentiate, how one cell changes into another over time by taking a single sample of the brain. Um, and in the future, we can um, measure things other than just gene expression. We can measure DNA state, we can look for mutations, um, and we can also look for things such as cell-cell communication, how do cells communicate to help drive differentiation and other behaviors. Um, and uh, so this poses great promise for, for discovery um, of mechanisms in in neurons. I'd like to thank Ray Cho 
at University of California, San Francisco, and his colleague, Jeffrey Cheng, uh, for working with us on the skin example, and also um, uh, my colleague, AJ Sedgwick, who did most of the computational work here. Thank you.